Welcome to this presentation on PTSD awareness and mental health and wellness strategies. Hello, my name is Vicki Enns. I am the Clinical Director of the Crisis and Trauma Resource Institute and an individual, couple, and family therapist with a special focus in the area of trauma recovery. I would like to introduce my colleague, Wilma Schrader. Hi, I'm Wilma Schrader. I'm a family therapist and a former mental health nurse currently in private practice. In my practice, I focus on psychoeducation for family members and health workers, and I'm a trainer with the Crisis and Trauma Resource Institute. Thanks, Wilma. Let's get started by going over what you will learn during this presentation. I will define post-traumatic stress and common signs and symptoms. I'll identify contributors to one's own levels of stress in nursing practice. I'll discuss strategies for mitigating the impact of and preventing traumatic stress from building over time. And I'll identify steps toward personal wellness, resilience, and a positive work culture. To begin our definition of trauma, we need to locate our conversation specifically in the context of nursing. By definition, nursing includes high levels of challenge and stress, as well as constant learning and reward through the experience of helping people. It is inevitable that the stress of this job will at times be overwhelming, and under some circumstances, it can leave impacts that linger. When this happens, it is considered a psychological stress injury. When the nature of such an injury includes a sense of overwhelming threat to a person's well-being, we consider it psychological trauma. Key to understanding the impact of trauma is its holistic nature. A traumatic wound can affect a person physiologically, mentally, and emotionally, regardless of the type of event that caused it. For example, impact may manifest physiologically through tension, fatigue, bodily pain, separate from any actual physical injury that may have occurred. Mentally, through disrupted worldview and a reduced sense of security or safety, or emotionally, through overwhelming and difficult feelings such as despair, helplessness, or lingering fear. Trauma can happen to any person when they experience something that feels threatening to one's physical well-being or is overwhelming enough to shake their confidence or sense of emotional or mental security. A person can also experience overwhelming threat vicariously when they witness something happening to another person. Even after an event is long over, at times there can be an ongoing impact, although each person will have their own unique response and not everyone will be affected the same way by the same events. Post-traumatic stress is when the impact on our minds and bodies continues over time. And vulnerability and coping form patterns of symptoms that may cause additional stress long after the initial event is over. These patterns of symptoms can exist in varying degrees, possibly resulting in post-traumatic stress disorder. Because of the inherent stressful nature of the work of nurses and the frequency of such overwhelming events, post-traumatic stress disorder is increasingly recognized as an occupational illness or injury for health professionals. Let's look at some categories of traumatic stress injuries that might occur. Primary trauma. This is when an event is experienced directly, such as a nurse being physically assaulted by a patient or a patient's family member while on shift. The traumatic impact is direct to the person. Secondary trauma. This kind of traumatic impact is more indirect through witnessing a threatening event that happens to someone else, such as the suffering or sudden death of a patient. Vicarious trauma. This kind of impact is when the internal belief system and perspective of a helper is altered after witnessing another's primary trauma. The key mechanism here is the nurse's own caring and deep empathy for another person, such as their patient or a patient's family. It is important to note that in the regular duties of nursing, a nurse could reasonably experience all three on the same day. In this way, it is common that trauma becomes a daily part of nursing life. Finally, there is also the broader impact from trauma through the impact on workplace and community culture. Traumatic stress can be felt collectively by a team and by a community within one setting. The impact of trauma typically causes a sense of disconnection so one example of collective impact might be when it becomes harder for nurses to support one another as they deal with their own stress. 
There is so much pressure and responsibility felt by nurses to be strong, competent, and to care for others over themselves that this results in a common feeling reported by nurses, that it does not feel possible to acknowledge out loud any impact when it does occur. This barrier can add to the impact for everyone. Let's listen to Wilma describe a case example of a nurse who is experiencing a couple different types of traumatic injury after a difficult outcome with the patient. Example one, death of a child. Ashley is a pediatric nurse in a medical unit where most of the children have a chronic illness. However, recently a four-year-old girl, Marta, was admitted with failure to thrive, secondary to parental neglect. Despite Ashley's and the other staff's best efforts, the little girl's condition worsened. She was transferred to pediatric intensive care, but died soon after. Ashley was hit hard by Marta's death. She struggles with feelings of guilt for not having been able to save the little girl. She's angry at Marta's parents and at the system for failing her. She can't get the images of Marta's frail body out of her mind and relives her care of Marta over and over, wondering what she might have been able to do differently. A sense of helplessness overwhelms her at times, and she distances herself emotionally from her other patients, maintaining a guarded and cold presence, her protective armor. In this example, Ashley is experiencing several layers of traumatic injury. There is secondary trauma through witnessing the suffering and death of her pediatric patient Marta. Research shows that child abuse and death of a child are among the strongest contributors to traumatic stress for nurses. Ashley is also experiencing vicarious trauma. She is feeling responsibility linked to Marta's death because of being so actively involved in her care, yet helpless to prevent a negative outcome. This impact is deepened from empathy due to knowing about Marta's family history that contributed to her condition. We can hear the lingering impact on Ashley through her withdrawal and disconnection to protect herself from the overwhelming feelings. As already noted, experiences of trauma inevitably occur at some point for all nurses due to the nature of the work. This impact deepens for some into post-traumatic stress disorder. The prevalence of PTSD among nurses is commonly reported to be about 25 to 30 percent experiencing post-traumatic stress symptoms across a range of nursing settings. In one meta-analysis examining the experiences of almost 4,000 nurses, of those experiencing post-traumatic stress, 50 percent reported a specific critical incident stressor as a precursor. Although the nature of critical incidents can vary greatly, among the most common type of critical incidents which contribute to post-traumatic stress are the death of a child, as in Ashley's experience, or the death of a patient long cared for and requiring extraordinary measures, sudden violence at work, or the suffering or death of a patient that a nurse feels a personal connection to, perhaps someone resembling a family member or someone else in their personal life. These kinds of research results also illustrate how post-traumatic stress can occur in any nursing setting, from intensive care to general floor contexts to long-term care facilities. Traumatic impact can also build more slowly over time with regular nursing duties, not only after a sudden critical incident. One common pathway to traumatic injury I want to highlight is that of the relationship between the cumulative effect of stress and burnout from fatigue, sleep deprivation, and high workload demands. There is a strong correlation between burnout and post-traumatic injury. A report from the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions includes research that predicts a likelihood of 71% of nurses will experience burnout at some point in their career. Although a person can experience burnout without traumatic stress, those with post-traumatic stress symptoms uniformly also experience burnout. The existence of burnout adds to a nurse's vulnerability of being impacted by traumatic stress. Nurses are often reluctant to acknowledge or reach out for help when experiencing burnout. In the research mentioned above, 80% of participants who did have burnout symptoms did not reach out for help. 
Common experiences that predict burnout include caring for high patient loads alongside equally stressed peers, conflict or miscommunication with patients, their families, or with colleagues, a workplace culture that leaves one feeling underappreciated, undervalued, and therefore less effective, and the anticipatory fear of being seen as weak or incompetent if one were to acknowledge the impact of any of the above. This visual illustrates one possible pathway toward post-traumatic injury that is an accumulation of various stressors. When we look at these together, it becomes clear that it is very understandable for impact to build to an overwhelming level. In any nurse's experience, there may be a combination of critical incidents over time, the expected resulting anxiety and stress in the acute period after such incidents, alongside other factors that may contribute to increasing burnout, such as inadequate sleep or rest. In this kind of situation, a nurse may be more vulnerable to the day-to-day -day stressors of their regular duties. Let's listen to a second example of a nurse who is experiencing accumulating impact over time. Example 2, Workload Complex Care. Kelly is working on a dialysis unit in a small community hospital. Over the past year, it seems that the patients coming in are sicker, with more chronic illnesses and complications. On this day, more than half of Kelly's patients have complex issues. Organizing the dialysis for today has required multiple phone calls. Kelly can hear the buzzer going in the next room, but can't leave this patient's side. A family member of the patient comes in, clearly worried and overtired, and speaks harshly to Kelly about no one doing their jobs well. Kelly feels frazzled, pressured and overwhelmed. Fears of having made medication errors dominate her thoughts. She feels like she just can't take one more day like this, or even one more hour. When a co-worker comes in the room to tell her another patient needs her, Kelly bursts into tears as her own stress floods to the surface. She leaves the room quickly, as she knows she just can't interact well right now with her colleague or the family member. Kelly's story includes the cumulative effects of working with patients suffering from chronic illnesses resulting in increasing burnout. This acts as a backdrop to a stressful shift. On the surface, her current day may not be very unusual. However, it is the combination of building burnout with everyday stresses that result in an overwhelming experience for Kelly. It is important to recognize that it is normal response to be overwhelmed at times by traumatic stress and where we can put energy for change is to put into practice greater self-awareness when such impact is happening, positive coping strategies, and communication habits that help buffer, heal, and hopefully prevent deepening impact. To review the typical impact from traumatic stress, first it is important to distinguish between the immediate impact that we may see in the short term, especially after a sudden traumatic event, and the longer term impact that can occur resulting in post-traumatic stress. In the acute period after a critical incident or sudden overwhelming stressor occurs, it is normal to see some symptoms in the short term. This may last over a period of a few hours to a few weeks. With adequate care and support, symptoms may resolve. When the impact continues to last past this time period, it is referred to as post-traumatic stress. Over time, the patterns of symptoms can deepen and become stressors in and of themselves. For example, a person may be experiencing higher anxiety at work and begins to have anticipatory anxiety the day or night before, dreading the feelings and worrying about further impact on the job. We hear this in Kelly's experience as she feels overwhelmed when asked to see another patient and her own fears and frazzled feelings take over. To further help recognize signs that impact may be building, we can review the four main categories of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. It is important to recognize that a person may experience some of these symptoms for shorter periods of time and not necessarily have PTSD. However, recognizing our own red flags can be important signals to us to increase our self-care and attend to our well-being to prevent any further deepening of impact. The first category are symptoms of intrusion and re-experiencing. These may include recurring unwanted memories or thoughts of specific events, 
nightmares or upsetting dreams that intrude on your sleep, or general physical agitation to reminders of events, such as specific places or activities that may be associated with overwhelming incidents. The second category are symptoms of avoidance, which are a natural reaction to the intrusion symptoms. These may include putting a lot of energy and focus into wrestling with internal thoughts or feelings, trying to make them stop, avoiding external reminders such as places, people, certain activities in order to avoid the anxiety and agitation that may come, and perhaps struggling to attend work or engage fully in one's duties. There may be a strong urge to get away and just not be there. The third category are symptoms of anxiety or high activation of affect. These may include outbursts of emotions such as lashing out in anger or irritability or sudden tears, difficulty sleeping or resting which is linked to one's nervous system being very dysregulated, being hypervigilant or constantly on guard. People often report it can feel dangerous to allow one's defenses to be down so relaxing becomes very difficult. Finally, the fourth category are symptoms of disconnection and negative affect and cognition. These may include feeling disconnected from oneself and others, persistent feelings of guilt, shame, or self-blame, inability to remember parts of an experience, persistent negative beliefs about self or others, such as telling yourself, I just can't do this, or everyone is blaming me for this. Disorientation, fogginess, which makes it difficult to concentrate, and the inability to feel joy. These symptoms are not a sign that something is broken or insufficient in a person. On the contrary, these symptoms are a direct result of our natural survival instincts working overtime to continually respond to the feeling of overwhelming threat and stress. When we put these symptoms into this context of survival, it can be easier to understand them in ourselves and recognize them in others. Let's review these survival responses briefly. When any human being experiences or witnesses a threat to physical, emotional, or psychological well-being, instincts kick in to help us rise to the challenge and either avoid or do something about this threat. This is coming from our autonomic nervous system, and these are not rational choices that we can think our way out of. These are normal survival responses that are instinctual when we experience threat. When the sympathetic arousal from our nervous system kicks in, we are flooded with stress hormones that help our instincts move us into mobilization. This results in an urge to do something, which might be to flee and get out of there, or to engage and fight or actively do something. Either of these responses can save our lives and enable us to help save others. However, when we are not able to successfully stop, avoid, or resolve the threat, we can become stuck in these responses. We heard Ashley pull away and distance herself from her patients with a cold, guarded armor. This is an example of flight and a way she is protecting herself. Kelly burst into tears and felt impatient toward her patients and colleagues, perhaps completely out of her character. This is leftover fight from the helplessness she felt to prevent what was happening for her patients, showing up instead in her interactions with others. A third option that may kick in if flight or fight is not possible or successful is freeze. This is part of the immobilization response, when we may shut down, feel stuck or almost paralyzed, and numb. This too can give us the best chance to survive the incident. However, it is the most helpless response, so often it is associated with a lot of confusion and shame. Let's hear one more case example. Example three, treating patients that resemble family or friends. Martin is a new graduate nurse working in palliative care. He finds this work very rewarding as he can help ease the pain of loss and death for his patients and their families. 
He is fond of all his patients and cares for them with compassion, but he is also able to let go at the end of his shift and relax at home. This changes when Susan is admitted to the unit. Susan is a young mother dying of cancer, the same age as Martin's little sister. In fact, Susan reminds Martin of his sister in many ways. When he goes home now, he worries that his patient Susan might die when he isn't there, and he starts to have dreams about his sister dying. He begins to have trouble concentrating at work, feeling like he's in a fog, struggling to stay focused while doing his duties. His colleagues notice he is more distant and has stopped joining them on breaks, preferring to disappear out of the hospital whenever he can. Martin is experiencing vicarious trauma from caring intensely for his patient, Susan. Because of the resemblance to his own sister, Martin is more vulnerable to the empathic impact of worrying about her well-being. We can hear the freeze response coming up for Martin as he experiences the foggy disorientation of dissociation at work and his increasing disconnection within himself and with his colleagues. One of the interesting things about Martin's story is that technically nothing overwhelmingly bad has happened. Susan is still alive, as is his sister. By understanding the nature and signs of post-traumatic stress, it is possible for Martin to recognize the power of empathy combined with fear and the importance of proactively taking care of himself to stay healthy in this challenging work. To help you recognize signs of post-traumatic stress, here are some examples of common symptoms that may show up in a typical nursing shift. Symptoms of intrusion. These could be sudden flashes of a traumatic memory that feel like they come out of the blue. Could, these could also be body pain and tension as you feel the impact coming up in your body memory. Symptoms of avoidance could be avoiding certain duties or areas of your workplace or having difficulty focusing or managing your time. Symptoms of anxiety could include apprehension about doing typical work tasks or compulsive coping such as obsessively rechecking medications. And symptoms of disconnection and negativity could include feeling guilty or doubting one's own competency, as well as interpersonal conflict and increased irritability. The good news is that our instincts also provide us with important pathways out of these patterns of survival. When we can recognize the signs and symptoms of flight, fight, and freeze, we can learn to access the right kind of care and support to help us shift out of threat detection mode. The kind of intentional care that allows the self-writing of our instincts to occur happens through actions such as physical rest and nourishment. This could be drinking water, ensuring we get enough healthy food, and taking time and space to really rest. Psychological and emotional support which could be proactively engaging and nurturing practices that acknowledge what we have been through. And positive social connection with others. This could be intentionally engaging with others with whom we feel some sort of comfort and safety. These are key factors to help reestablish equilibrium in our nervous system, in our thoughts, and in our emotional well-being. Taking steps to actively build a toolbox for self-care allows us to stay healthy and may even promote greater resilience and growth. To build such a toolbox of strategies, it is helpful to consider core themes that are reparative to the nature of a post-traumatic injury. These core themes are safety, taking steps to connect with a feeling of safety, learning to distinguish clearly when we are able to settle in our nervous system, which increases our ability to stay grounded. Choice intentionally creating and protecting space in our life to engage with activities and practices that are meaningful, build on our confidence and on our self-compassion. And connection, proactively strengthening our relationships, building a network or team of support. This is a crucial resource to nurture a culture in the workplace that promotes sustainable and healthy psychological safety and well-being. The Alberta Government Occupational Health and Safety Act sets out guidelines for identifying psychological hazards that may affect the mental health of workers. 
These guidelines provide information to help employers and all workers cooperate to protect the health and safety of themselves and others. A key area within the guidelines is prevention through providing tools and education for dealing appropriately with stress of the workplace. Specific suggestions include education and skills development, management of personal perceptions of stress, lifestyle management, managing the personal work environment and seeking supports as required, and communication strategies. These tools are reflected in the following specific strategies related to each of the reparative themes of safety, choice, and connection. These are some practical steps that can promote our actual psychological safety when we are under stress. Paying attention to this foundation of self-care helps reduce our vulnerability to how intensely we're impacted by stress when it happens. First, building our awareness about the impact and signs of traumatic stress, particularly learning your own signs and symptoms of wearing thin, what tells you that the stressful impact may be accumulating in a way that makes you more vulnerable. For example, when stress is mounting for me in my counseling work, I notice my own irritability go way up, I become much less patient with family and colleagues, and I forget basics of my own self-care. I might go all day forgetting to drink water or eat lunch, and I usually really like lunch. Paying attention to these small signals helps me avoid the bigger signs, such as physical illness, avoidance of things that are important to me, or a bigger dip in my mood, which might take me down a path towards signs of depression. Establish routines of self-care that are meaningful to you and can be a consistent, regular part of your day. This includes the basics of food, water, exercise, and rest. These small things are often the first things to get pushed aside or get disrupted when our stress goes up. Movement is a powerful stress release, especially if it is movement that you enjoy and feels like a release to physical and emotional tension. For example, taking the stairs often is a good idea. It becomes a great idea if you also focus on positive thinking as you walk, hum a favorite tune, or pair it with listening to an inspiring podcast. Finding ways to intentionally practice joy is crucial to push back against traumatic stress. Additional strategies that build a sense of internal and psychological safety Include things like finding ways to regularly settle and calm your nervous system so that you are not pulled into just reacting to a particularly stressful shift or a long day. Be intentional to create opportunities to support your body and mind to shift out of a stress state so that you can connect with the feeling of increased safety. Some practical ways to do this are to regularly stretch your body, particularly noting where and how you hold tension. Breathe, practice belly breathing, and pair your breath with calming thoughts. Release stress and settle. This means to really notice and absorb times of calm or increased relaxation. We are often in autopilot as we do things like eat lunch, walk from one place to the next, or drive home. These could be opportunities to shift your focus to the present moment, taking in the sights, smells, and sounds of what is happening around you. It is also helpful to ensure we have ways to engage in things that bring in a sense of curiosity and wonder. Choose small steps such as these that are meaningful to you. You will gain the most benefit from having consistent strategies that allow you to practice shifting out of the inevitable stress buildup that will happen in any nursing environment. These strategies will then be much more helpful to you if you find yourself in a situation of higher stress. Here is one brief example of what strategies of psychological safety could look like in the course of a regular shift. A nurse comes out of a patient's room after a stressful interaction, feeling unable to alleviate the person's anxiety and suffering. Using self-awareness, the nurse says to himself, I know this feeling, it's helplessness. I've been through this before. I know I can accept this feeling and breathe through it. Using emotion regulation strategies, the nurse walks down a side hallway and looks at a window. Focusing on the trees and sky, he connects with the feeling of his emotion. Doing some breathing exercises, feeling his feet on the ground, 
he's able to settle his body and his thinking and then move on to his next patient. It is these kinds of small, brief strategies built into your everyday work routines that can support your whole nervous system to be as resilient as possible. The second theme for healing and the impact of traumatic stress is choice, which helps build restoration of overall wellness. Self-compassion is a key component of this theme. Sometimes people are less comfortable with the idea of self-compassion. The idea here isn't self-pity or indulgence, rather it is recognizing that we are all worthy and deserving of care and wellness, period. As we show up to do our work to help others, we also deserve to be cared for and nurtured in ways that promote our own well-being. Choosing to turn toward ourselves with respectful honesty and kindness allows us to continuously learn even when things go wrong or in unexpected ways and not to be crushed by it. Engaging with others in these kinds of conversations to debrief work situations and create safe spaces to be authentic and acknowledge the impact of stress at work means we will have more choice of how to respond and be less likely to get stuck in reactive and defensive patterns. Building on our foundation of psychological safety, choosing to attend to all of our well-being, both inside and outside workspaces, helps build holistic and balanced health. Often there is an area of self-care that comes easier. We enjoy it, it is familiar, and so we can keep doing it. For example, I love to walk outside in any season, spring, summer, fall, and even winter. I just bundle up. This is a central part of my self-care that keeps me moving. I can usually build it into my day. Continuing what already works well is an important place to start. There are also usually areas of self-care that we each struggle to keep up with. For example, I can easily forget to protect space to have meaningful connections with friends and family outside of work time. Weeks can go by and I realize that although I have interacted with lots of people through work and the basics in my family life, I have been neglecting what is meaningful to me outside of who I am at work. I spend much of my time attending to other people's emotional and mental health, taking time to ensure I plug into relationships or activities that nurture my mental and emotional health often gets pushed to the back burner. I encourage you to take stock of what helps you restore your energy in physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual ways. Challenge yourself to put some in energy into all areas of your health. This is key to build overall resilience as all areas of health are interconnected. When under stress, we are naturally wired to notice and remember the stressful experiences more than any other. It becomes too easy to miss or minimize the positive outcomes with the patient or the laugh you shared with a colleague. Make it a practice to regularly consider what is going well and what you are grateful for and noticing in order to absorb these positive experiences. This also creates more resilience in us and the ability to engage with humor, appreciation, and gratitude are important antidotes to burnout, self-criticism, and negativity. And finally, participating in building positive connection in your workplace culture is the third theme in healing traumatic stress. A culture isn't shaped by any one person. It is a collective effort with the support of administration to be creating healthier and safer workspaces that encourage acknowledgement and positive understanding of the impact of traumatic stress, it becomes possible to deepen the network of connection across healthcare teams. When individuals are engaging actively in their own self-care and also in the intentional building of healthy environments at work, this builds collective sustainability. Building a positive and safe workplace culture is supported when we bring an attitude of self and other respect, appreciation, and compassion. This creates room for the diversity of ways people respond to stress and build confidence in their work. It is common that when a community has experienced a lot of collective stress, indirect communication and sarcastic humor become more frequent. People become more isolated and self-protective. The pent-up stress may get taken out on each other in conflict or avoidance, resulting in more miscommunication. 
Teams that build on norms of respectful and assertive communication, practicing active listening and taking time to build in healthy humor and playfulness into daily work environments. These teams show greater resilience and overall less impact from post-traumatic stress. Your peers and colleagues are typically among the most significant support for buffering and restoring health after traumatic incidents. A key element to this is to work together to counter the stigma that tells people it is not okay to feel vulnerable or to admit impact from traumatic stress when it happens. Take your own health and well-being seriously by reporting incidents, asking for and engaging with support, and offering empathy and compassion to your peers. This also makes it more possible for your colleagues to do the same. Laura Van Dernut Lipsky in her book, Trauma Stewardship, writes about the gifts and the costs to those working with others' psychological and physical trauma. She emphasizes how crucial it is to pay attention to our own mental and emotional health and offers this encouragement. Taking care of ourselves while taking care of others allows us to contribute to our societies with such impact that we will leave a legacy informed by our deepest wisdom and greatest gifts instead of burdened with our struggles and despair. With this approach of proactively protecting and building our own resilience, we can actually increase our capacity to do our work. We can experience post-traumatic growth and increased resilience. Steps that can move you in the direction of post-traumatic growth and resilience rather than post-traumatic stress include build an intentional structure for holistic health, including the themes we've been exploring, safety, choice, and connection. Proactively nurture a strong support network around you. Pay attention to your own mind and body awareness and emotional regulation, which means acknowledge your feelings and listen to your body's limits. And intentionally create and protect space for joy in your life. When these themes are embraced collectively, the whole community becomes stronger and more resilient. To summarize the key concepts we have explored together today, we've discussed what post-traumatic stress is and its signs and symptoms. We have identified common contributors to traumatic impact that can allow you to recognize where you might be vulnerable. We have explored many practical strategies that can mitigate and prevent building impact from traumatic stress and protect your psychological safety. And we've discussed concrete steps that can increase your own personal wellness, bolster resilience, and contribute to your own community and work culture. I want to leave you with some questions for reflection and further food for thought to deepen your own intention and awareness of what you can do to keep yourself as psychologically safe as possible in your work. Thank you for taking this time to learn about post-traumatic stress and to reflect on your own well-being. Recognizing the importance of professional responsibility and accountability for individual fitness to practice helps ensure you are providing safe, competent, and ethical care. If you have any questions with regards to this presentation, please contact the CLPNA.